Teddy uh, Einstein, who will tell us about relatively geometric actions on that zero key complexes. Well, thanks to the organizers for the invitation speak, and uh, it's been a great conference so far. And thanks to all of you for staying for Kasha's talk. <laughs> All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about relatively geometric actions on cat zero cube complex, which I'm not sure uh, if that was the advertised title, but that's what it is now. And um, so this is about relatively hyperbolic groups acting on cat zero cube complexes. And my goal today is to kind of try to convince you that this is some natural way of thinking about relatively hyperbolic groups acting on cat zero cube complexes. So I won't spend too long on the story because I think most of you are familiar with this story of, you know, We've had this tremendous progress initiated by people, including Donnie and uh, Haglund, that sort of culminated with this proof of characterizing virtual specialness in terms of uh, hyperbolic groups acting on cat zero cube complexes properly and co-compactly. And you know, this culminated with Eagle's theorem uh, that shows that those are virtually special. And so um, relatively geometric actions are going to give you a nice way to think about sort of trying to get some of the same machinery for relatively hyperbolic groups in a way that might sort of allow us to do more things than if we just consider plainly geometric actions. So uh, I was told on Tuesday that I'm going to define many things in this talk. And the first one that I'm going to define is a relatively geometric action. So uh, without further ado, definition, let's let X twiddle be a cat zero cube complex. And let GP be a relatively hyperbolic pair. So for now, if you're not familiar with what that means, I'll do some justice to that a little bit later in the talk. But for now, you should just think of this as some finite collection of subgroups um, contained in G if you don't really know what that is. Um, the action. of G on X twiddle is so-called relatively geometric. If so, zero, it's going to be by isometries, but I'm too lazy to write that down. One is that uh, if I take this quotient, uh, I want this to be compact. So I want this to be a particularly a co-compact action. Two, I want cell stabilizers are um, finite index in some P in script P, and I want this to be a P to the G. So in other words, cell stabilizers should be finite index in some parabolic. And just to be clear, this is not like there's one parabolic that contains all the cell stabilizers. They just have to be in some parabolic. So. Uh, Jason Manning would be yelling at me right now for getting my quantifiers all messy. And three um, is that maximal parabolics um, act elliptically. So in practice, this means that like every P and P is going to end up stabilizing a vertex. Okay, so the salient features that you should notice is that this is very much not a geometric action, at least if you have a relatively hyperbolic structure that makes sense because you should be having infinite cell stabilizers. So not proper. You should also note that this is not going to produce a geometric action, or sorry, if I have a relatively hyperbolic group acting geometrically on a cat zero cube complex, that's not a relatively geometric action in particular because it has to be proper and co-compact. And so this condition is not going to be satisfied. So it's not like a priori obvious that if I produce a relatively geometric action, or sorry, if I produce a geometric action of a relatively hyperbolic group on a cat zero cube complex, it's not a priori a relatively geometric action. And you should expect that, like, well, later I'll address this a bit, that it is true probably that a relatively hyperbolic group that acts geometrically on a cat zero cube complex should also act relatively geometrically, but on some other cat zero cube complex. That's correct. So, so this is all like relative to the structure that, or it should be relative to this particular structure. And so the, the relatively hyperbolic group should act relatively geometrically with respect to the peripheral structure that you want and not just uh, 
not the vacuous one. Okay, and so some immediate examples. So one of my favorite examples is, of course, the vacuous example, which I think Thomas alluded to, which is, of course, G and its own peripheral structure acting on said point. And so, but this is this is in some sense vacuous, but this is going to be useful in certain situations, like when you want to do some type of combination type theorem, or if you want to do what me and Thomas are doing with the small cancellation free products in particular, Particular, you might want to take your free product where this is the relative geometric action on one of the factors. And so this turns out to be useful because then you get this machinery where it's all relative to G and you can still say interesting things using the cubicle machinery that you get when you build relatively geometric actions, even when they're based on these silly ones. Um, da, 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 da. Other examples. So of course it was known before that if I take a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold group, that it acts properly and co-compactly on a cat zero cube complex, but just for the sake of you know, thoroughness that, that you, know, you, can, um, you can bootstrap this for relatively geometric actions. So finite volume hyperbolic three manifold groups which it took me a long time in my life to realize that not all of them are actually hyperbolic groups, despite, despite the moniker. Um, two, uh, so there's been some recent work um, by Damani and Suraj Krishna that for free bicyclic groups uh, with certain conditions. So you should talk to Francois if you want the precise lowdown on what they are. <laughs> because I cannot recite them at this particular point in time. Um, there's also the small cancellation free products. So I should say before I go any further that you know, this was joint work with Thomas and most of this work as well is going to be, most of this work is also joint with Daniel Gross. Um, Okay, good. Everyone happy? Um, there's also been some recent work by uh, Bregman, Zhu, and Groves to sort of look at some certain kinds of lattices, and this is some kind of interesting result that you can help characterize lattices uh, in case that interests you. Okay, so my next goal is to kind of get into why relatively geometric actions and show you some of the salient features that make them particularly nice to work with and why this definition is, is good. Um, so first, is um, nice connections to relative hypervelocity. So I'm forgetting one of my other nice examples, which is the following example. So if you think of, uh, so if I take a free product and I look at you know, G acting on the bass tree. tree, and this is a group that's relatively hyperbolic relative to the factors. And this action on the bath serre tree, it's this nice hyperbolic space that you're acting on. It's not a proper and co-compact action. In particular, you, know, you have infinite vertex stabilizers. That's sort of the whole point. But you have this sort of notion, in fact, you know, between any two points, there's a unique geodesic. And in general, if you want to think about relatively hyperbolic things, one way you can think about it in the way of Bowditch is to think about like a graph where there's sort of, it's not locally finite, but there's kind of a coarse finiteness of how many ways to get from point A to point B of a certain quality quasi geodesic. That's one way to think of this. And this is called an action on a fine hyperbolic graph. And you want to be co-compact with finite edge stabilizers. So in some sense, this is like a very easy example of a relatively geometric action, but it's sort of starting to show how you might see the relatively hyperbolicness of the group through the space that it's acting on. And that's one of the advantages of relatively geometric actions over geometric actions is that the relatively hyperbolic geometry will be readily apparent in the action of the group on the cube complex. In particular, um, having spent a lot of time on a very painstaking uh, work with relatively hyperbolic things acting geometrically on a complex, the geometry gets really nasty really quickly. So it's much nicer to be working in some space that is hyperbolic, particularly. Okay, so the relevant theorem here 
I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to share a truncated version of it. Uh, I think Thomas alluded to this theorem the other day as well, is that in this paper on uh, something about art and groups by Charney and Crisp, there's a relative version of the Milner-Schwartz lemma. And what in particular this, this shows is that if I have a relatively hyperbolic pair, GP and acting relatively geometrically on X twiddle, then X twiddle is um, equivalently QI to the coned off Haley graph for GP. So the coned off Cayley graph, you take all the pair, these, this collection of subgroups and you cone them off. So you basically put a cone on top of them to make them sort of disappear metrically, at least they become coarsely a point. And you want this graph to sort of be finite. And then you also need to satisfy some technical condition on how the peripherals are allowed to overlap. And that's another way that you can see relative hyperbolicity. But in particular, this connection is useful because you see now that through this action, you are now QI to something hyperbolic. And so you now see that this cube complex that you're acting on has a hyperbolic metric on it. And so, so this makes your life a lot easier for doing geometry. Um, more generally, people usually do ask me about this result. So more generally, you should expect to have, like if this is a group acting on some hyperbolic graph and you have some finite collection of stabilizers and everything's finitely generated or finite collection of stabilizers, up to conjugacy, then you should be relatively hyperbolic relative to those things. And you should get a uh, quasi isometry to the Kondoff Cayley graph with respect to the maximal stabilizers. So, another useful point about this is that also this, the action of G on X total one. So, on the one skeleton, in a sense, witnesses. Relative hyperbolicity of. Oh. Is this x is cat zero but not hyperbolic, right? Well, it becomes, it is hyperbolic because you have this action of a, of. Okay, so that's going to be a consequence. That's a consequence of this course, uh, of this relative Milner Schwartz lemma. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you get, you are now working with a hyperbolic space. In particular, this, I'm going to be more specific in the sense that this witnesses the relative hyperbolicity of GP in the sense that. It's not quite a fine hyperbolic graph, but with a little bit of deformation in a very equivariant and sort of only finite way, you can turn it into a fine hyperbolic graph. And so just to quickly plug a paper with Thomas and Daniel Groves, one of our goals is sort of make this connection natural and try to make things more black box so that you don't have to worry about going from this cat zero cube complex to its one skeleton to this fine hyperbolic graph. You can kind of think about them all at once. In particular, this also is important because, as Thomas mentioned, um, we want to think about the Bowditch boundary of this uh, group and the, this relatively hyperbolic pair, I should say. And so this isn't, of course, simple. Nothing in life is simple, especially with relatively hyperbolic groups. But you can sort of construct the Bowditch boundary by taking the visual boundary of just this hyperbolic graph which you took from taking the one skeleton of this cube complex. And then you need to throw in some points that correspond to the infinite cell stabilizers. Uh, you can kind of do something like that, but the issue always is that you have to be careful about like carrying things from one place. Like you can think about them independently, but the problem is, is that you want to be able to do this because you have all this cubical information and you want to be able to translate the cubical information to the boundary. In particular, um, you know, later on, I'll talk about certain situations where you care about what the boundary is. And also like we have this boundary criterion for cubulation, which I'll get to a little bit later. And so it, it is kind of important to be able to like directly construct the boundary on the space that you're interested in. And this is one of the annoying subtleties of working with relatively hyperbolic groups is that there are lots of different ways to think about the boundary but it's not like when you're thinking about the boundary of a hyperbolic group that there's sort of some clear correspondence between all the features. You have to be very careful about how you do things, especially because things are not proper. So um, no properness, no happy. Um, <laughs> well, I spend a lot of time thinking, 
gee, it, this would be trivial if this were a proper space. And then I go digging through Bowditch, and then eventually you find the correct analog somewhere. It's buried deep in Bowditch's paper on relatively hyperbolic groups. Um, okay, so other so this is one natural reason why these are nice. The other big hammer in our tool chest is relatively hyperbolic gain filling. And this is a particularly useful feature. Um, and the main point of this is that it gives us a way to bridge the gap from what we know about hyperbolic groups acting on cat zero cube complexes to relatively geometric actions. And what we're going to be able to do is to bootstrap all these amazing like residual results about residual finiteness and separability and bring them up to relatively geometric things. And so that's what we're going to do next. Um, so uh, I apologize if you all are experts in relatively hyperbolic gain filling, but you're about to get a brief introduction. Um, so say I have this, this uh, GP, and now I choose for each P in script P, um, a normal subgroup and P contained in regular P. And I'm gonna call this a filling kernel. Nah. Okay, and amazingly, this determines a quotient G of, I'm gonna call this script N where N equals the collection of. So I get some quotient from this and it's totally unreasonable that you should expect that if I take these, like just take some kernels and then I union them all up, I take their normal closure that I should get any kind of reasonable quotient. But this is what's amazing about Dane filling. So in particular, this was introduced by Ozen, I think around 2006, 2007, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and with sort of some contributions as well by Groves and Manning that, um, oh, I need one more thing. So, so this G of N is equal to G mod, the normal closure of the union of the NPs. And we say, say Q, I can't do script EQ as well, holds for all sufficiently long Dane fillings if there is a finite B so that um, all and P avoid B um, ensures G of N satisfies Q. So you should think of Q as being like some group property, like for example, hyperbolic, which is what it will be in just a second. So you basically take this quotient and so long as you have these sort of designated filling kernel subgroups, avoid this finite set, you things will behave nicely. And it turns out that this is actually true. So, so some would call this the fundamental theorem of relatively hyperbolic Dane filling. Okay, hold on. No, oh, go away. Sorry, technical issues. I think I had the typewriter feature. <laughs> okay, so um, let's let So again, everything in sight is relatively hyperbolic. And now I'm going to also allow myself some other finite set in G. And so this finite set is going to be a nice set of elements. And the amazing thing is that I'm going to be able to control the destiny of these elements in this quotient. So I can make sure that they survive the quotient. And so you know, the tip off is that this is going to have nice residual implications. Um, so for all, sufficiently long Dane fillings, G to G bar equals G of N 
which I'm also going to denote as g mod k, where k is the same as this. So first of all, um, p mod np embeds in g bar. So you're going to sort of be left over with you know, what happened when you took the peripheral mod the filling kernel. Nothing bad that happens there. Two, um, the pair g comma p bar, where p bar equals p mod. Okay, this is getting bad. Um, let's do it this way. And then I want, forgive me, this is scripted p bar. So that's the set of all the p bars. It's going to be relatively hyperbolic. In particular, just for emphasis, if um, all n p are finite index, g bar is hyperbolic. So of course you're now hyperbolic relative to finite things if this setup works out. Would that be g bar from that? Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, yes, that should be g bar and p bar. Thank you. That makes a lot more sense. Um, and then fourth of all is that um, g to g bar is objective on this set. So in particular, you have this set of finite, this finite set of elements that you can control the destiny of. They map injectively. They don't die in this quotient. And this sufficiently long condition is nice because you can do other more technical ways of conditioning these Dane fillings, and you can keep doing successively, or you can continue imposing more onerous conditions. But as long as everything keeps being for all sufficiently long, you just keep doing these things, and you can condition your Dane filling to do very nice things for you. Okay, so in practice, let's see how this actually works out. Yes. On this, oh, sorry, I switched fonts here let's just call it f so I, I designated some finite set and i want that to be finite i think i said that and then i stupidly didn't write it down okay so let's see how this uh how this benefits us as opposed to just being some technical nonsense oh <clears throat> so here's a theorem so we'll start with a relatively hyperbolic pair. My peripherals to be residually finite. I'll say more about what that is in a second, but the point here is that like, if you're gonna be finding these fillings, you wanna be finding them so they end up being hyperbolic. And in order to have a good supply of sufficiently long fillings, you need your peripherals to be residually finite. So you can extract these finite index filling kernels to your heart's content. Um, so if G acts relatively geometrically on a cat zero CC, then there exists G naught contained in G, which is finite index, so that uh, G naught mod X twiddle is a special cube. Okay, there's a little little bit of lies in there. Well, it's not quite lies, but it's slightly disingenuous. Uh, it's two values. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I just automatically assume X tilde is a cat zero cube complex. Um, okay, so this you should recognize as some kind of relatively geometric analog of Eggle's theorem. There's also a relatively hyperbolic geometric version of this due to Eduardo Oregon Reyes, who's a student of Eggle. Um, but the reason why this is sort of a lie is that like topologically this is true, but sort of from a doing group theory and algebra standpoint, this is not really strictly useful as written because this quotient is actually a complex of groups because you have infinite stabilizers. And so this gets a little bit uglier and more technical, but you can actually salvage this in a, in a pretty nice way that allows you to have all the things you want and eat your cake. So 
So key, key point is that um, there's, there's a theorem due to Groves and Manning so that for all sufficiently long fillings and also with uh, some small technical condition that's not very difficult to satisfy. And so I won't bother justifying it. Um, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I will, sorry. Force of habit. Um, Right, where was I? Oh, right. So for all sufficiently long fillings, uh, G mod K, uh, it turns out that X twiddle mod K is still cat zero. And so what's miraculous about this is now you get this action G mod K acting on X twiddle mod K, and this is hyperbolic acting on cat zero cube complex, this is virtually special. And in particular, that's how you get this, uh, you know, this is how you can get this link to being special. You sort of apply finite index covers in the right way to get things that are special. And with this quotient, you can topologically identify this quotient X twiddle mod K by G mod K with just X twiddle mod G, but then you need to finite indexify to get actually special. And so that's why you have to pass to this finite index. So in particular, you can actually do a little bit better. So when I said this is an ugly complex of groups, it's true, but you can clean it up a little bit in the sense that you can get rid of all of the finite stabilizers. So you can make sure all the local, at the complex of groups level, all the local groups are going to be either trivial or infinite. And further, you might worry that you have this annoyance where you know, your stabilizers or your local groups, depending on how you want to think about it, are peripheral sub or parabolic subgroups, but you can actually insist that they're maximal parabolic. So this is a particularly nice complex of groups. It doesn't have any twisting elements. So while it's like annoying, it's totally tractable to prove some things about that. And maybe if I have some time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about things that you can do with that, that complex of group structure. You're anticipating my next point. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so I will bore you, but for the benefit of some of the graduate students, I will define what residually finite is now. Um, what was that? It was right here. Oh, in fact, actually, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to tell you what separable means. So, um, definition is that G be a group and H be a subgroup of G. Um, <laughs> H is separable if for every G in G without H. So I give you some element that's not sitting inside of H. There exists a finite quotient. And I want the kernel um, to contain H where P of G is not equal to one. So I have this quotient and I want to extract this finite quotient where I have my group element here. I have the kernel of this quotient, H is inside the kernel and the group element sits outside. So you, you can think of the kernel as separating this group element uh, from H. Um, and specifically when uh, the trivial subgroup is uh, separable, G is residually finite. Do you really mean H inside with the kernel? Are you just meaning that the image of G is not an image of H? That is, sorry? Probably yes, but. Uh, we thought it was there's a finite index that contains H, but not okay and that's, I think that's right yes often when I, I screw up this definition and forget that H is supposed to have any relationship to the kernel and neglect to mention that and then I get in big trouble 
Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar, residual finite is an object of great fascination. If you can prove that every, uh, if you can prove that every uh, hyperbolic group is residually finite or not, or there are non-residually finite hyperbolic groups, you'll be a very happy person and you'll be showered with grants. So I recommend doing that if you have a good idea. Um, Oh, is that right? Okay, well, well, I think I think you should endeavor to do that and prove us all prove me wrong. I'm I'm waiting, Donnie. I'm still waiting. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Okay, are we happy now? Okay, good. All right. Anyway, uh, aside from that, the point of separability is that it has sort of neat implications for doing geometric things, in particular, turning. Um, immersions into embeddings and finite covers. So this is a highly desirable property if you haven't worked with it before. Um, right. Okay, right. And so why is, why is uh, GP acting uh, geometrically uh, residually finite? Why is GP? Okay, so the idea is that you know, given G in, um, so if I give you some group element, I wanna construct some finite quotient where it doesn't die. So the idea is now you apply relatively hyperbolic gain filling and G now goes into some P of G and this is not equal to one, G mod K is, oh yeah, and what is G mod P with, sorry, I keep forgetting. You should always assume, if I don't say otherwise, that I want residually finite peripherals because everything goes badly because you can't do your relatively hyperbolic gain filling the way you want otherwise. So you do sort of the right relatively hyperbolic gain filling, you get something that's virtually special and that theorem of Ozen's make sure that this element doesn't die and now you're in a virtually special group, which is residually finite. So now, of course, B of G can be put in some quotient where it doesn't die, that's finite. And so you just pass G down here and then through the other quotient where it doesn't die in G mod K. So in particular, this is like a very easy example of this trick, but you can do even better. So if you want separability for full relatively quasi-convex subgroups, so meaning relatively quasi-convex subgroups that also sort of interact nicely with the peripherals so if you run into a peripheral, you either have finite intersection or you can basically contain that peripheral up to finite index. Um, and so you get separability for that. Um, a result by Minassian and Minet also shows that you can turn that into double coset separability as well. So these should be sort of have all the familiar loved residual properties that you expect from things that were virtually special in the hyperbolic situation. So this is good. Okay, so now I'll recall the boundary uh, criteria that Thomas introduced last time. So, so let's let um, GP be uh, relatively hyperbolic. And for, so if for every, uh, X and Y in the Bowditch boundary of G, there's a full relatively quasi-convex subgroup H as co-dimension one, so that uh, X and Y lie in, I want these to be in H distinct components so the Bowditch boundary is, you know, there are many ways to look at it. One way is to take, you know, look at the coned off Cayley graph, 
at some points, take some weird topology, take the visual boundary, put them all together and get some, some big mess. Um, but what you want to find is sort of these co-dimension one subgroups that act as walls and slice your toned off Cayley graph in half and sort of split the boundary up in the right way so that if I give you two points in the boundary, I want to be able to cut them apart with this subgroup in particular. And that's what this limit set is about. So previous work by Bergeron and Weiss give a hyperbolic boundary criterion using various standard cube constructions. And the idea here is that like, if you do the same thing in this setting, then you're going to get a relative cubulation. So now you'll get something that's co-compact, but your, um, your stabilizers are no longer going to be finite. And so things are not proper. Um, so one salient feature of having this cubulation criterion is that like, if I want to construct a cute relative cubulation for a group, it suffices to construct a relative cubulation for a finite index subgroup. So this is something that's annoying if you're working with just straight regular relatively hyperbolic groups because you don't have a nice boundary criterion and it's hard to induce up from a relatively geometric action on some G naught and get some action for G. Whereas here you can just get your relative cubulation for your finite index subgroup and then reuse the hyperplane stabilizers of the cubulation you get to get a full cubulation for, for G comma P, well, a full, a relative cubulation is what I should say. So this is nice. In particular, if you're working already with like things that come from cubicle things or have nice residual properties, which you probably expect them to have, if you're going to end up with something relatively cubulated, then you can do stuff like use separability, use residual finiteness, clean up your group by passing to a finite index subgroup and then cubulate and then profit. So this is a particularly nice feature of working with relatively geometric actions that you might not really necessarily expect to get if you're working in the plain old relatively hyperbolic and geometric situation. So something stable that fixes the boundary will fix your, what if you have the, do you want it to act effectively on the boundary to get like an effective act on the complex? Like what, if it, what if you have like a finite subgroup that fixes the boundary if you're a relatively hyperbolic group? Uh, they can cause you problems with the- A finite subgroup. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, that subgroup activity, like, on that. I guess it's okay. I mean, yeah, you end up, you might get it as some kind of stabilizer, but again, like the eventually, once you get your relatively geometric action, you can kind of clean everything up by passing the finite index subgroups and getting rid of any of the finite stabilizers. So, it, in practice, this turns out to be not really a, an issue. Okay, so this brings me to the talk that I have entitled in my uh, prepared notes as What Now? <laughs> Um, so, so what's this sort of useful for? So there's kind of two things I want to share with you for the rest of the talk. Um, one of them is the following theorem. Uh, that, um, so suppose that GP is going to be a relatively hyperbolic pair again, um, where all P and script P, I'm not very good at P versus script P, Let's, let's get that right. So we're all P and P uh, are virtually abelian and um, the Bowditch boundary of G is homeomorphic to S2. Then GP uh, is relatively geometrically on a cat zero cube complex if and only if G is finite. So this is a you know, version. So Hysinski gave some hyperbolic version of a uh, you know, canon conjecture type criterion. And this is a relatively geometric version of it. Um, so you know, the goal, ideally from this, you know, we, I don't think we know much more than this at this point, but we would like to sort of you know, start to understand like what do relatively geometric actions with spherical boundary look like? And what does that tell us? And, of course, this would say that it would be nice if we could do some serious work in terms of classifying those. Um, how to do that at this point, I'm not entirely sure, but it's neat. And the other sort of big um, conjecture that we're working on is the following. So um, in the rel regular relatively hyperbolic case, there's this paper by Shu and Weiss about cumulating malnormal amalgams, which is the idea that if I take, you know, the gold standard is if I take 
cubulated things and then I want to like amalgamate them together or do HN extensions, ideally I want to end up with something that's still cubulated. And we would like something relatively geometric for that. So conjecture is that if um, at, um, let's do it this way, start with A, P, A, and B, P, B are relatively hyperbolic and act relatively G on uh, each on some uh, cat zero. CC. So just to be clear, they individually act on different cat zero cube complexes. They don't have to act on the same one. Um, and now if I take, if uh, G equals A star CB, where um, C is full, relatively quasi-convex, um, then G acts relatively geometrically on pet zero CC with uh, structure. So I'm being a little bit vague about what I want to have happen, but you know, the idea is that if I have A and B, I should be able to kind of take their peripherals together, but you have to be careful about because you're amalgamating over something. And so you might have to do some slight edits to, to get a true peripheral structure. But the point should be that that you know if you take something that's full relatively quasi convex in each of these, then you should be able to create a new relative cubulation. So you should be able to get some kind of you know, hierarchy situation where you can start at the bottom and sort of inductively build up your relatively geometric cubulation from pieces. So the good news is I think we know roughly how to prove this conjecture. The bad news is, is that it's quite technical <laughs> and will probably still take us some time to write. Um, but just to give you some sort of vague insight into like, how does this actually go and why, why should we expect this to be a reasonable thing that would happen? Um, here's sort of a couple of the cliff notes. So one um, is that you wanna to reduce to C being malnormal. So you do some separability residual work, you mess around, you pass through a bunch of finite index subgroups and everything kind of washes out nicely so that you can assume that C is malnormal. Two, uh, now you should see that the boundary of, um, I should say the, the Bowditch boundary. Yeah, sorry, uh, bad habits. Um, two, so roughly speaking, once you're in the malnormal case, you can use results of uh, Damani to show that your boundary is actually going to look sort of like a tree of spaces where each of the trees is going to be like, uh, or the vertex spaces of the tree are going to look like boundaries of the factors um, in your original amalgamation. I should also note that I've artificially stated this as being for an amalgam when we expect it to hold for HN extensions as well and for you know, finite graphs of groups over full relatively quasi-convex subgroups as your edges. Um, so that happens naturally with these normal case. Yes, turns out. So so either um, uh, two points in the boundary lie in uh, different vertex spaces, in which case you expect, you know, here's boundary point one, here's boundary point two, and I want to apply my boundary criterion. There's going to be an edge space in the middle, or really there's going to be an edge group in the middle that's going to act as our co-dimension one subgroup that's going to separate those two things. So um, the issue then boils down to, well, what if they lie same vertex space? So you can imagine, let's draw a little picture. So you can imagine that, you know, here I have my tree of boundaries, which isn't not going to do a very good job of drawing. And you can imagine that I have point A and point B. And you can imagine that each of these factors was relatively cubulated. And so you should have an ample supply of co-dimension one subgroups, namely the hyperplanes. So you should be able to extract something that's kind of co-dimension one that's going to separate these. But the issue is that it might start to, it may be co-dimension one locally, but globally in this entire boundary, it's not clear that this subgroup is going to give you something that's going to sufficiently separate these two points. And so the hard part that, that 
remains to be completely hashed out is to figure out, well, how do you extend this co-dimension one subgroup into something that's globally co-dimension one? And you need to do some like very dirty tricks that involve like every cubicle thing you can possibly imagine. You'll need to do something like, we'll take this group and pass it through the edge group, then use some relatively geometric version of canonical completion retraction to sort of pull it up into a co-dimension one thing in the other subgroup. But by this time, you've done horrible things and passed all kinds of finite index subgroups and you need to clean up carefully and make sure that you get something that doesn't accidentally end up having sort of one side instead of two sides. And so this gets very technical and very painful and this is why it's taking several years to write up. And I think that's a good place to start. I mean, you should expect to get some kind of, you should expect to get some kind of um, hierarchy exactly. Like you should be able to build hierarchies out of this. In particular, one other corollary that will follow relatively quickly from this is that if I have a group that acts, uh, if I have a relatively hyperbolic group acting geometrically on a cat zero cube complex, you can use some version of this along with like heavy hitting results of Oregon Reyes and things from my thesis to kind of end up getting a relatively geometric cubulation immediately for that relatively hyperbolic group that acts geometrically. So in some sense that the relatively geometric things should generalize um, relatively hyperbolic things acting geometrically, at least with residually finite peripherals. I always mean residually finite peripherals, just like Kim always means one ended. I think I also have a question. Yes. Um, so what are the peripheral subgroups for G in this case? So ideally you want it to basically be PA union PB, but you need to be a little bit careful because sort of things being the, the thing you're amalgamating over being full kind of takes care of any issues of like worrying about what happens, but you just need to be careful notating like, you know, what if one peripheral subgroup sort of lives in both of them and then you want to be careful about what you take your exact structure to do. But I think that's more notational than technical. Well, so for the for a, um Relatively geometric act, and it's just like this same idea as in uh, the Bergeron Wise paper, but because the residual finiteness, you can get like proper, I'm sorry, open path acting, you can suggest relatively token path. Vaguely, but I, I mean, I think the, the point is that if you just sort of follow your nose and do Bergeron Wise, you, this is what you get when you sort of just do this, but with the hypothesis they're I don't know, was there like residual finiteness assumption from I, Oh, the residually finite peripherals doesn't need to be assumed for the boundary criterion. It's just that if you want to have the, if you, no, no, if the residual finiteness thing, residually finite peripherals is important only if you want to get all this Eggles theorem stuff. It's so that you can do the Dane fillings. And if you can't do the Dane fillings, these peripherally, so-called peripherally finite Dane fillings where you end up with a hyperbolic quotient, then you're screwed. So uh, you really need the peripherals to be residually finite for that. But for just constructing the per the cubulation, you don't need any of that restriction on the on the peripherals. I mean, there's also sort of one the one restriction that you do need is like you do need them to be sort of you need to make sure that your walls are going to be co-dimension one with respect to these peripherals. Which like if the peripherals are one ended, this is easy. If not, you might need to monkey around, but doesn't exactly present a huge obstruction. I don't know your name also. What's your name? Okay. Very good. Nice to meet you. So, uh, no questions? Let's have the speaker again. <laughs>